Hi everyone, welcome to the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron's Level 2 Cruising Course up to Cowell. And we're starting off with Module 1, so we're looking at safety and weather planning. So safety and weather planning go hand in hand. We really need to keep a close eye on what the weather's doing when we're going cruising. We're going to be away from the city for an extended period of time. We need to make sure we're not going to be in a storm. So. Let's have a look to see how we're going to avoid doing that. Yeah, so it's best not to sail at night if, if you don't have to, but sometimes the wind will die and we'll end up sailing at night. So it's good to have the experience of sailing at night on this level two course when we go up to Cowell, but at this stage it's probably better if you don't plan to sail at night. So when we're thinking about um, hazards, one of the biggest hazards that worry me when I'm sailing at night is a man overboard situation. You know, you could be in the water for a long time. It might be that you're in the water until morning when, the, when it becomes um, daylight again. That might be the only time you get found. So you really must be wearing a life jacket and it would be really good to avoid a man overboard situation using tethers and jack lines, and we'll go on to describe what they are in a moment. But using them will help us not have a man overboard situation to start with. But if we do find ourselves in, a, in the water, we'll be very pleased to have a life jacket um, and hopefully have a flashing light on that life jacket. Planning our trip is, is crucial. You know, we, we need to have a think about where we're going, what the conditions are gonna be like, when, while we're sailing and if the conditions are not right well we'd better make some smart decisions and and not go sailing or go in a different direction when the wind is 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 more easier for us to handle check in the weather forecasts and looking at the paper charts and considering those conditions in the directions that we can sail it might be that maybe going to Kowau is a stupid idea you know, in a northerly, for instance, when we're going to be sailing upwind for eight hours or something, maybe on that day we should go to Waiheke. If we go east when there's a northerly wind, we'll be on a beam reach and we'll have a fast, fun sail. We'll get to where we're going quite quickly and we won't be smashing into waves all day. So that might be a more comfortable trip. So making some smart decisions on which island we visit. There's 70 odd islands out in the Haraki Gulf and they're all really cool. It doesn't matter which one you go to. Yes, we can sail upwind. The question is, do we want to? Or do our um, crew want to? So checking the weather forecast will help us make good decisions and we need to make a th or keep a 360 degree watch. Other boats, they come from all different angles and it could be that you know, we've got a power boat coming up behind us. The, the hazards don't always appear from in front of us. Um, obstacles and uh, rules. Well, we're going to be getting into that in this um, series. Um, when we say keep your boat dark, we mean avoid white light on the boat. We really don't want to have any white light on the boat at all. Because if someone shines a torch in your face or flicks a light on inside the boat that's it that's all your night vision gone and you know when the lights turned off it might take five or ten minutes for us to get our night vision back again red lights don't seem to get rid of our night vision as much as uh, white light does so if we have a red head torch or red light inside the boat that would be much better for sailing at night because that red light will maintain our ability to see things at night. White light will just get rid of our night vision instantly. So while we're out sailing at night we really really want to be wearing a life jacket and it's really good if it has a, a light on it and that light needs to flash. We also want to whistle to, to gain um, people's attention so if we can see um, a flashing light and hear a sound then you're much more likely to be found tethers as I said before we can you know we can avoid falling off a boat or becoming detached from a boat maybe we fall over the side but if we're tied onto the boat with a tether 
then all we need to do is stop the boat and get someone back on board. We don't have to look for them in the darkness. Life jackets will need to be serviced every couple of years and tethers, yeah, they do wear, you know, stitching and um, the, the, the carabiners, they can all become corroded over time. So we want to check them before we go sailing and before our night sail to Kowau, I will be checking all the life jackets and the tethers and making sure that they're all suitable. So jack lines, that's a rope that goes from the stern to the bow and it's a rope that's not used for anything else apart from clipping our tether onto. And it should allow us to go from the stern to the bow without needing to unclip ourselves from that rope. It's really important that if there's any work that needs to be done on the bow, that we can get there and back safely without any risk of, of being lost at sea. So something that ties us to the boat but allows us to move. That's what the jack line and the tether working together will allow us to do. A PLB is a personal locator beacon, and that's in the bottom right-hand corner, that little yellow box. Pretty neat little yellow box because um, that will communicate via satellite to the rescue centre in Wellington. And the rescue centre in Wellington will organise a... Uh, a search and rescue effort. So Coast Guard, police, they'll all get involved and they'll all be sent out as soon as that PLB is activated. And they should activate as soon as they get wet. And the light and the PLB can be contained within the cover of the uh, life jacket. So once you've got your life jacket on, you've got all your safety equipment with you. An AIS-enabled PLB will be a little bit better so AIS stands for Automatic Identification System and that will report your position to the Rescue Centre in Wellington but it will also report your position to all of the boats that are AIS enabled in your vicinity. So the boat you fell off may well be able to have your location marked on their chart plotter and also Around Auckland, there's lots of ferries and other commercial vessels like fishing boats that would be able to join the search. And if they've got your coordinates marked on their chart plotter that are being updated, so the wind and the tide make you drift off from where you first went into the water, an AIS-enabled PLB will be able to direct the emergency services, yes, but also the vessel you fell off and other vessels in the vicinity to your location for a successful rescue. So if you are planning on doing some fairly long trips and, you know, more so than just in the inner harbour, an AIS-enabled PLB would be the really a Rolls-Royce piece of safety equipment. A PLB is about $500.00. An AIS-enabled PLB is about $700, but I'm sure in time they'll come down in price. But Let's have a look at life jackets. Here's a life jacket that we're going to be using on our way up to Kowau, and it's really easy to put on, and it doesn't take up much space. It's um, really comfortable too. So you just put it on just like a normal jacket. So you one arm through, the other arm through, and then we've got a small square and a big square. The small one just simply goes through the middle of the bigger one. We also have a, a ring on the front and that's where our tether is gonna go. So this is a tether. We've got two carabiners. To open the carabiner, we need to push the locking mechanism out of the way and then open the gate. And then we can clip that on to our life jacket. The other end, will go on to our jack lines. So jack lines are simply just a rope that goes from the stern to the bow. They're pulled quite tight and they're just used for clipping these onto. We don't want to be clipping onto a main sheet or a jib sheet, something that's going to be adjusted because we might end up falling in the water as that rope's adjusted. So that's our tether. If we're using a tether, then if we fall in the water, we just need to stop the boat and pull someone back on board. If we're not using a tether, 
we're going to have to turn the boat round to come and look for the person. This one is nice and simple though, just two carabiners, one for you, one for the boat. Now I'm going to get this out of the way and we're going to have a look at um, some other features of the life jacket. So on the side we've got the adjustment that I talked about. Also on the right hand side is this little red toggle. The red toggle means that it's automatic. It also says automatic here. So if we're in the water this should inflate automatically. If it doesn't we can give the toggle a quick pull. And here we go. It inflates. It's quite startling when it inflates. Um, and I can't move my head at all now. It's really, really tight. Now I have heard weird stories about people stabbing these things because they can't breathe because they're so tight. That seems a bit of a waste. If you take the cap off this red tube and turn it upside down, that little bump will open the valve and you can let a bit of air out. So that just makes it a bit more comfortable. There we go. So I've taken a bit of air out. If I let too much out, I can blow in that tube and put a bit more air in. Here's my light, and that should come on automatically as well. Let's see if it works. I press the button. Oh. Yeah, there we go. So there's the light flashing. Um, if you're in the water, there's not a lot of point in swimming. You may as well just take it easy, have a nice little relax. With that light flashing, we're gonna turn the boat round and come and look for you. There's also a whistle. Now, if we're blowing on the whistle and got a flashing light, we're probably gonna be found. It's certainly gonna be a lot easier. So, <whistles> and waving arms. The life jacket also has reflective parts on it. So, to give yourself the best chance of being found at night, you definitely need to be wearing a life jacket, but you're not gonna be found until the morning unless you've got a light on your life jacket. Even better if you've got a PLB. The PLB can be attached in a similar way to the flashing light. Now, I just need to try and take it off while it's um, fully inflated. Here we are, we'll have a look at um, checking the weather forecast. And we really want to look at the forecast right now and over the duration of our passage. So what's the trip going to be like in two hours' time, in three hours' time? And if it's an eight-hour trip, well, we need to have, we need to look further into the future at our forecast. But what if our forecast isn't correct? Now, I very much like using Windy, but there's also another app which I like, which is the New Zealand Coast Guard app, and that's very good at now casting. What now casting is, is live weather readings from a number of different weather stations around New Zealand, all over New Zealand, but in particular here around the uh, Haraki Gulf. So here we're displaying what Bean Rock is like. And um, what I like to do is compare the weather forecast to what the live weather stations are, receive, are showing. If the live weather station says that the wind is 10 knots and the forecast says the wind is 10 knots, well, I'm pretty happy with my forecast. I think that's a reliable forecast. It won't never be exactly right though, unfortunately. The forecasts are a forecast and they are always wrong. It's just really a question of how wrong. If the forecast was for eight knots, but I'm seeing 25, I really want to be considering what's going on. What's different to what the forecast is seeing and how bad is it going to get? Is it that there was weather that was forecast to come five or six hours later and that's just arriving early, or is it that the wind that we have had hasn't passed over yet, and if I wait a few hours, the wind will be more like what, the, what was forecast. So having a look at comparing the forecast and the now casting will give us a better idea of the reliability of the forecast, and that will give me confidence to go out sailing. 
So let's go and have a look at these apps. Let's have a look at the Windy app. And that's that red icon at the top there. There we go, so here's Windy. And I really love this piece of software. It's a really good app. It's very graphical. So straight away, I can see the, the dark colors, the, like the dark red, that's really strong wind. We've got the orange, which is quite strong. We've got the green, which is absolutely perfect sailing, sort of 10, 20 knots. And then we've got the light blue, which is really light wind. So we might be struggling to get underway there, but it's sort of, sort of five knots and less in those light blue colors. And I can see the direction that the air is moving. And with just a, a finger and a thumb, I can zoom in on Auckland and I can see specifically what the weather's gonna do. Now, Kauau is that island at, more up the top, sort of uh, just to the right of the word that says Walkworth. That's Kauau. And Auckland, more in the center of the um, page. So we're gonna sail from Auckland up to Kauau. And if I touch the screen about where Terry is, here we go, I can see that right now, the forecast is for a 17 knot northerly wind. And I can scroll around and move that to wherever I want the wind reading. Let's have a look, see where more it is up to Cowell. Okay. So Terry is a really good spot to measure the wind. You can see that slightly outside of Terry, it's a bit more. If I go in the Terry channel, it's a little bit less. Down the bottom, we can see the days. And if I press the play button, we can just go forward and I can see what's going to happen. You can press the pause button. So here we go. I see on Sunday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it's going to be 18 knot northerly at Terry. Now, this is really useful. I can zoom in. I can move a chart around so I can have a look. Wherever I'm sailing, I can have a look to see what the weather is like where I'm going to go to. So if I move back to Saturday, I can see that we've got a 16 knot northerly. And as Saturday progresses, we're just going to build and we're going to end up with 18 knots, I think. No, not quite that much. If we were to travel up to Kauau today, we would find that there would be quite big waves and we'd be sailing upwind. If we sail across to Waiheke, well, I can see that that is going to be quite a nice reach, the stretch of water around Beachlands in the centre of the page just down the bottom there. It's, it's going to be quite sheltered because we've got Rangi Toto and Waiheke sheltering us. So while today might not be a great day to go to Kauau, it would be an awesome day to go to Waiheke. And Waiheke is awesome. But you know, we can have a great time on Waiheke. We can reach there. We can reach back. There's some good bays to stay as well. But heading up to Kauau, well, we're going to be slamming into waves and they could be quite big ones and it's going to take us quite a long time because we're sailing upwind. We're going to have to zigzag around and that's going to be quite a long, exhausting trip. Let's compare this to what the wind is actually doing out there and we'll see how different the weather forecast can be. So if I close this app down and we click on the Coast Guard app, so here we can see that at Tiri is 18 knots and 28 knot peaks. So there's 28 knot gusts. And that direction we can see there, 004. So zero is north. So it's, it's practically uh, north. That um, sort of gray circle next to Tiri Tiri Maitangi, if I touch that, I can see lots of different now casting weather stations that are scattered all the way around New Zealand. So if I was planning a trip and I was looking at a forecast, you know, maybe I'm starting off in Auckland, I'm going up to Whangarei, I can have a look, see what the weather is doing up at Tutakaka. So we've got 19 knots there, a peak of 26. So I can see what I'm sailing into. But for us, for our trip to Kauau, I want to have a look to see what's happening at Bean Rock. That's the closest weather station 
near us. So right now it's 21 knots out there. And if we're going up to Tiri Tiri Matangi, I can click on there and I can see that at Tiri <coughs> it's 19 knots. So a little bit more than what the forecast says. And that's not surprising. You know, the forecast being wrong, I mean, it'd be unusual if it was correct, really. It's just a question of how wrong and, you know, if I was happy at sailing at 18 knots, well, I'm probably going to be happy at 19 knots. But I'm probably going to be aware that the forecast is reading slightly less wind than what's actually happening. So if that forecast is for the wind to pick up, then it might be stronger than I was expecting. I think the forecast was for it to die off. So it might be that it just hasn't started to die off yet. So in a few hours' time, maybe the wind will start reducing. If we compare the forecast to what's actually happening, that will give us a bit of an idea of how accurate the forecast is. And that should give us a bit of an idea whether we want to be out there or not. Let's go back to Bean Rock, 21 knots. Let's go back and remind ourselves what um, Wendy thought the wind was going to be. So 21 knot average right now, 26 knot gusts. If we go back to Wendy, and right now, Bean Rock Lighthouse is reading 21 knots. The forecast is for 16 knots right now. So the forecast is slightly less than what's actually happening. It's really good information to understand so that we can think about our boat, our crew, make sure we're not out there sailing when we don't want to be. So that's the Windy and the Coast Guard app. Two really useful bits of software, two bits of software that I use on a daily basis. Another thing we need to do is to know our course. Now, to do this, we're going to use paper charts. And on Tuesday evening, we're going to go over the paper charts. I'm going to tell you all about them. We're actually going to draw lines on the paper charts, get some compass headings, and actually fill out a bit of a cheat sheet so that we know where the rocks are, what the lighthouses are doing, and the water depths in the different areas that we're going to be sailing in. We'll plan our trip. I really like using paper charts to plan our trip. Sure, when we're out sailing, we're not going to bother with paper charts. We're probably going to use a chart plotter or Navionics. Navionics is an app that you can have on your phone. We um, need to plan on a paper chart, though, because it really does set us up for a really good passage. If we can have a bit of a cheat sheet, and then we know what's coming up. We know the flashing sequences of the lighthouses. We know where the rocks are. And we can have a really good passage that's nice and safe. So I really like paper charts for that. While we're out in the water, we're probably going to be using the chart plotter, as I said. But what happens if we've got a flat battery? Often, in emergency situations, the battery getting wet is very common. Or maybe there's just a malfunction on the boat and there's a problem with the battery. Either way, if we lose power, we don't have our chart plotter. So planning your trip on a paper chart will set you up for success in those situations because you will be able to use those skills that you practice on a paper chart while you're underway. And we will actually do more paper chart work on our level three cruising course, which usually goes out to uh, Great Barrier. So we'll cover the paper charts on Tuesday evening. So another thing that's really good to do, really good practice to do, is to file a trip report before any passage. And we can do a trip report in a number of different ways. Most common way to do it is on a VHF radio. Now if we do it on a VHF radio, the Coast Guard collects information from us. They want to know the boat details. They want to know where we're leaving from, where we're going to, our estimated time of arrival and how many people are on board. Now, 
when we get to our destination, we're supposed to give them another call on the VHF and say, thanks very much, we've met, reached our destination, and close our trip report. If we don't do that, the Coast Guard don't start searching for us. They will only start searching for us if we get reported missing. So that means, probably for this trip, if I don't turn up for work on Monday morning, they'll say, oh, I wonder how the trip to Cowra went on Friday. Maybe we should get, start looking for Peter. And, you know, that's a long time to be in the sea in the life jacket. So a better way to do that is actually using the app. Let's, let's go and have a look at the app. It collects the same amount of information, but it's a much more efficient way of getting the information to the Coast Guard. And as you'll see as we start going through the app, that there are some significant advantages in terms of using the app as opposed to using a VHF radio. Let's open up the Coast Guard app and lodge a trip report. So here we can see the weather that we were experiencing today. And if I click, click on the blue bar at the bottom where it says log a trip, we go into the next section where we can actually lodge that trip report. So, will you be crossing a bar? Now in New Zealand, you have to contact the Coast Guard before and after you cross a sandbar. Sandbar, sandbank, they're often found at the river estuaries, particularly on the west coast of New Zealand. We won't be crossing a, a bar, so I'm gonna click no. Now we will need our trip details. So we're gonna go one way to Kowau. We're leaving from, and I'm gonna type in West Haven. West Haven Marina, Auckland City. And I'm traveling to Kowau. Now if I touch that gray circle beside the words traveling to, I've got a map and I can find Kowau on the map. Here we go, right up here. And I like that spot, so I'm gonna go there. And here we go. So there's the bay in Bonacourt Harbor. So the date of our arrival will be today. I'm leaving at 2, 2 p.m. So it's probably gonna be an eight hour trip. So let's change that to uh, 10. There we go. Yeah. Leaving West Haven, traveling to Bonacourt Harbor. And we should arrive there by 10 o'clock in the evening. Click next. Cruiser is a boat that we've used to run this course on before. It's a 38 foot catamaran and Zulu Mike Tango 4918 is, is, is its radio call sign. Let's change the boat. Now, oh, Inasmara, let's go on Inasmara. Inasmara is a really cool classic sailing boat, 60 foot long. Beautiful boat, Inasmara. I really like sailing her. I can add a new boat. Put in all the details uh, and then use that boat. Let's carry on you with Inasmara though. Now we're going to sail up there with eight students, two coaches, so ten people all together. Click next. So Megan is a really awesome person that works with me in the office and she's my sure contact. Now if we fail to get there on time the app will automatically send Megan a text and say, hey, Pete's late getting to Cowell. Maybe you should give him a call, make sure everything's okay. And if she can't get hold of me, maybe she'll give the Coast Guard a call and say, hey, well, well can't get hold of him. Maybe we should start looking. So let's click next. So here's a tab just to check our information. We're leaving West Haven. We're going to Bonacourt Harbour in Cowell. And we should be there today. We're going on in Asmara with 10 people on board and Megan's going to get a text if we don't get there in time. So let's, let's press go. And now we have that countdown. So we've got eight hours and 55 minutes to get there. If we don't get there in time, Megan's going to get the text. They won't start coming looking for us if we don't get there in time. It will only be if someone reports us missing. So that text message to Megan would be really useful 
for her to be able to contact us, check that we're okay, and if she can't get hold of us, then, yeah, report that back to the Coast Guard and they can start a search for us. Now, one of the best bits about this app is that it's transmitting the position of my phone to the Coast Guard. So as long as my phone is in, the, in my pocket, while we travel up to Kauau, the Coast Guard will be monitoring our position. And if my phone gets wet and stops transmitting its position, well, hopefully that's where they're going to start coming and looking for us. If we do a trip report via VHF radio, they won't know where we are on our course. They'll know we, where we left from and where we're going to and we're somewhere along that, that course, but they won't know exactly where we are. With the app, they can track our position and I find that really useful. I certainly don't mind the Coast Guard knowing where I am when I'm out sailing. So there we go. That's the uh, Coast Guard app and how we log a trip with them. I'm just going to close this trip. So just click close. And there we go. That's our trip closed. So we're in Kowau. We've closed our trip. Time to have a beer and relax. Yeah. Okay, so that's the uh, Coast Guard app. It's a really useful app. It's very much well worth the $4 it costs. Um, one last thing, just don't wing your trips. It's really much better to plan, make sure the weather's right, make sure it's suitable for everybody on board the boat. You know, we, we really need to make sure that the uh, non-sailors that we want to encourage to go sailing are not put off by having horrible experiences on boats. So plan your trips, have a fantastic weekend, and you'll find that you have a very successful um, cruising experience. Thanks very much. This is the end of module one. I'll see you in module two.